How many have seen that movie? That's The Matrix. We're going to talk about that uh, in a little while. I just wanted to plant the thought in your head of that scene there. And we're going to come back to that. So uh, so Eric was getting ready to head out of town, and uh, and I said, uh, "What are you gonna? Who's gonna? Who's gonna preach?" And he said, "I don't know yet. I think I'm just gonna do a video, you know, of himself." And I said, uh, "I got an idea." <laughs> and I said, uh, "You know, maybe uh, you might want to let me cover for you, because uh, you know, typically in most churches, you know, the worship leader gets one Sunday a, a year." And he almost always preaches on worship, right? So I was like, you know, hey, I, I think I might have something I want to talk about. I want to talk about worship. And he said, hey, it's yours if you want it. So he was kind enough to oblige and let me do this. So um, thank you for, uh, for, for tolerating not just the music portion of the service, but now the sermon portion of the service. But um, we're going to talk about worship. And and the first thing I want to make clear is worship was not just what we just did for 20 minutes with music and singing. You know, worship has almost become like Xerox. You know, in the world, you say, make a copy of that, make a Xerox. It's synonymous with the, word, with the other word. And unfortunately, worship has become synonymous with singing and music. Um, you even hear, you know, it's on the radio they talk about worship. When you watch ch other churches on, online or on TV, they talk about, you know, you know, the praise and worship. Well, that's just one way of praising and worshiping. And if we just do that on Sunday morning for 20 minutes, and that's all the worship that you do all week, you are going to be a very anemic, weak Christian. And God's not going to be able to speak to you, and you're not going to be able to really communicate with God, because... Praise and worship is supposed to be a lifestyle. We're supposed to basically breathe in and out the presence of God all the time so that we're talking to him all the time and we're worshiping him all the time. But we're going to talk about why we do that. But let's talk about some other ways that we worship besides music and singing. Clapping our hands is a form of worship, right? When you, when you give God a praise offering of clapter, or clapping. Also, serving in the church, being his hands and feet is another method. Whether you're doing it in the church or if you're doing it for your neighbor or, or somebody else in your family, you're just serving them. That's a way of, of, of giving God worth. And that's what the word worship comes from. It comes from worthship. So anything that ascribes worth to God is a form of worship. Um, one of the definitions I really love is, true worship is a valuing or treasuring of God above all things. The inner essence of worship is the response of the heart to the knowledge of the mind when the mind is rightly understanding God and the heart is rightly valuing God. That's a deep, long sentence. But really what it's saying is anything that is ascribing worth to God is a form of worship. And that means your mind is aligned and now your heart is moved by God that you want to say something or do something. That is worship. Um, fasting is another form of worship and it's all through the Old Testament where people fasted when they really wanted to seek God for something. We're going to talk about that as well. Bowing, showing reverence, right? People bowed before their kings. They bowed before God. They bowed before Jesus. They fell to their knees. That is a way of showing that um, you are worshiping him. What about some things that you don't normally think of as worship? Um... What if you watch the Buccaneers and Tom Brady and he hands the ball off and one of his running backs runs into the end zone and then he takes a knee and points up to the sky? Is that a form of worship? Isn't he saying, God, I could not have done that unless you had given me those abilities? He's ascribing worth to God, right? 
Same thing with a baseball player, you know, hits a home run and he comes around third and he, you know, you know, maybe does a cross on his on his chest or he points to the sky, you know. In a way, in a form that is worshiping. I'm not sure which God he might be worshiping, but he is worshiping a, a higher being than himself because he's saying that that was because of you that I was able to do that. Another form of worship that we don't always think about. So let's say Brian, Casey, posts yet another picture of a beautiful sunrise on his Facebook <laughs> page, right? And we love him. But let's say that he puts in the caption, God's handiwork, or look at God's art today or this morning. He's ascribing worth to God. That is worship in the modern day and age of social media. So you can, you can ascribe worth to God at any point during the day or night and uh, show him that you are, you are ascribing worth to him. So worship is in all kinds of forms. It is not just about music and singing, though those are great things. And for me, it's my passion. Music is my passion. But... I'm working on making God, you know, Stephen Curtis Chapman has a song, and I love the words because he talks about, you know, that the music is his consuming passion, and man, that's me. Music is my consuming passion, but I'm striving to make God my magnificent obsession. He needs to be bigger than this, and that's kind of what worship is all about. So, why do we worship? Well, number one, we're commanded to. It's pretty clear that the Bible tells us that we are supposed to worship. God created us to worship. And we find that one of the first examples of that is in Luke 4, and this is 5 through 8. And it says, The devil led him up to the high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, if it will be yours, Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. That's pretty black and white, isn't it? A couple more verses that talk about that. Exodus 34, 14. We're going way back in the early part of the Bible now. Do not worship any other God, little g, for the Lord whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. You know, think about it. Let's say that you spent six days, you know, creating everything. And all of a sudden, one of your creations over here decides to worship one of the other created things over here. That's, that's, that kind of worship is reserved for God because he's the creator of all things. So he's basically saying, no, 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 no. I'm a jealous God. I made all of this, and I'm the only, I'm the only person in, the, in existence that's worthy of your worship. So we're commanded to only worship him. Psalm 69, 34, we're not the only thing that's told to worship. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and all that move in them. And if that wasn't enough, you ought to jot down this. Psalms 148, the whole chapter he names everything that's supposed to praise him. And I'll just run through these really quickly, but he says, praise the Lord, praise him, angels, sun and moon, shining stars, earth, sea creatures, lightning, hail, snow, clouds, mountains, hills, fruit trees and cedars, wild animals, cattle, little creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and nations and rulers, young men and women, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord for his name alone is exalted. He's telling the whole creation to praise him. And if you think about that, when he rode into Jerusalem on the donkey. Do you recall that some of the Pharisees told him, you know, 
oh, they're singing Hosanna, Hosanna the highest, and all that kind of stuff. And some of the, you know, elders and uh, Pharisees said, you know, hey, tell your people to stop doing that. That's not right, you know. And he said what? He said, I can't make them stop because if they did, even the rocks and the trees would cry out. See, he, under, he understands, of course, since it's his creation, that if I don't have a human being somewhere on this planet praising my name and worshiping me, then creation will do it. That tweet, tweet that the bird's doing, I don't speak tweet, tweet, <laughs> right? But who's to say that bird isn't saying, praise God, praise God? Or that babbling brook, or that snow falling or whatever. It says, the Bible says that all creation is praising him. We just don't understand it. One day we are going to understand it and it's going to blow the Cheerios right out of our bowl, right? <laughs> but I'm telling you, this stuff is deep because it's supernatural. Amen. So he's commanded us in the Bible plainly that we are supposed to worship him. Now, I did say praise, and I did say worship kind of synonymously, right? But there's a difference, and I want to make sure that people understand that. I can praise God, but I can also praise Ernie for his amazing guitar playing skills, right? Or I can praise Robert Knapp for his amazing fishing skills, right? I can even praise myself for my amazing joke-telling skills, But don't ever mistake and start to worship me, right? I should never be worshiping Ernie or Robert or myself or anybody else because that is reserved for God, the creator. So we got to make sure that when we praise people, that's okay, but we don't lift them up and set them on a pedestal or an idol because that is reserved for God. And we do that a lot today. We are in the land of stars and sports figures and all these people. And we want to keep elevating them up because we want to see somebody that's worship worthy. But they're not. You can praise them for what they do and what gifts God gave them, but never catch yourself wor worshiping them, even if it's your favorite musician, like I do sometimes. So... so the second point, so the takeaway from that is worship uh, is expected by God. Now, the second point, too, worship is warfare. Worship is not just what we do for God. God uses worship in everyday life events. And we have a couple of examples, great examples in the, in the Bible to tell us uh, where he did that. Um, the first one is, we're going to jump back to Second Chronicles, but let me set this up for you. King Jehoshaphat. I don't know if you're old like me. Sometimes people say, jumping Jehoshaphat. I have no idea where that came from. But Jehoshaphat was the fourth king of Judah. Basically, it was David, then Solomon, and then a couple people who didn't do anything really worth talking about, <laughs> and then Jehoshaphat, right? So he is... David's great, great, great grandson. That's where we're at in time. I know there's a lot of time in the Old Testament. But what happened was, so he's a king and everything's going great. Oops, don't touch that. Um, and all of a sudden, these people that live nearby, the Moabites and the Ammonites and some of the Immunites, decided they wanted to wage war against the children of Israel. So, Jehoshaphat, being a godly man, the first thing he did, he did was he said, you know what? He goes, uh, I don't know what to do in this situation. Um, I'm going to ask the whole nation of Israel to fast and seek God. Can you imagine if the president of the United States, whoever that's going to be after next Tuesday, <laughs> said that Russia and China with a few of the North Koreans are going to wage war against the United States. 
I'm sorry, but we don't run strategies to handle that kind of thing. That's, that's a, you know, that's, but can you imagine if the President of the United States said, I want the whole country to fast and seek God. That's what's happening here. I mean, that's a monumental action to take. God, it'd be awesome if we did do that stuff, right? Wouldn't that be awesome? So anyway, he seeks God, and God tells him through his, one of his priests, he says, uh, I got it. You're going to be victorious. You're not going to lose anybody, um, and I'm going to tell you how to do it. So we, we pick up in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 21 says, After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of of the army, not behind the army, ahead of the army. And they sang, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. That sounds like something we've sung before. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammonites. By the way, Am, uh, Ammonites, Ammon, Jordan, that's the modern day Jordan that we're talking about, these people were coming from. He set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab, and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. In fact, it goes on after this to say that um, the kingdoms that surrounded Judah, once they had heard about how the God of Israel defeated these armies, they didn't want nothing to do with the Israelites. And there was peace in the land for a long time because of that one battle, the battle that belonged to the Lord, right? We've sung about that, too, when he says that, that the battle belongs to me. Here's another story that you maybe have heard. How many people have heard about the, the walls of Jericho, battle of Jericho? So in Joshua 6, 2, now, now this is an interesting one because after the children of Israel had came in out of the desert for 40 years and, and finally were in the promised land, Jericho is the first city that God told them to go conquer. So this is the first city after being in the promised land. And he told them, you know, go, I have given you the city. In fact, that's the first, first words of the verse, Joshua 6, 2. Then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry bazookas of, oh, carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times when the priests blowing their trumpets. When you hear that sound, a loud blast on the trumpets, have the whole army shoot their rockets. No. Oh, give a shout? What kind of battle plan is this? Then the walls of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. So once again, God demonstrates it's not, it's not strength, it's, it's me. And, and, you know, you could defeat your enemy with a toothpick if God is on your side. And the same thing for us today. These might have been in the Old Testament and things, and for examples for us, but God is still saying it today. Cast your burden on me. When you're facing something, you need, to, you need to lay it on me because I'm right here waiting to take over that battle for you. But, you know, we're so caught up sometimes that we're just like, I, I got to muscle through this. I got to, you know, get tough. I got to, you know. That's not how God made us. God made us to rely on our father. You know what? Call my daddy. When I'm in trouble, I'm going to call my father because he will get me out of this no matter what. So the takeaway on that is praise and worship is a powerful weapon, and it's at our disposal all the time. That same God that with the same power that defeated armies is ready to, to, to defeat your enemy if you will turn and talk to him. But that kind of brings us to point three, and I want to do, I want to do an illustration. This is, kind of goes back to that Matrix video. Um, you know, Neo had a choice there of taking one pill and life goes on just the way it appears, you know, 
And this life seems to have everything that you could want, pleasure and comfort and everything. Or he takes the other pill and he wakes up to reality, what the world is really about. And I love the movie because whether these guys knew it or not, they were encapsulating the Christian decision, the believer decision in one movie. And that is, you know, this world is walking around and what they think this is, this is what it's all about. These cars and these houses and these homes and jobs and, and retirement and all this other stuff, they think this is it. And they got this, you know, they got that, that much time to do it. Um, but if you're a believer, you know that there's a bigger focus. So I have an illustration here. I'm going to show you. I'm probably going to walk off the camera for a second. So let's, let's pretend that this rope goes out that door and it goes straight up into the sky and it goes past the moon through our solar system out past our galaxy and into the universe and it just keeps going it's a really long rope okay it just keeps on going can you pretend that with me and now let's pretend that this rope is a timeline right and let's pretend that this little part right here is our life on earth. There's not a lot there, is there? What's funny is what you do and decide here decides all that. And I have some friends uh, that are not Christians, they're not believers, and they think I uh, am crazy. And they like to refer to me as a super religious person because for some reason this God thing and Jesus seem to be like, you know, the center of my universe and everything seems to revolve around that. And I'm really not into all this, you know. It's kind of like the appetizer. I'm ready to get past the appetizer and get to the, get to the main course. And my focus is I try to keep it on that and not this. Um, but they kind of look at me as a super religious guy because of my focus. I try to keep my focus on that. And here's the funny part is I like to listen to them sit around and go, well, you know, <laughs> I'm going to work real hard between here and here. And then I'm going to really enjoy life, you know, between right there and there. I'm gonna travel the world, you know, and that kind of thing. And I'm thinking, and what about that? You know, they're not thinking about that. Uh, they want to travel the world right there. I want to travel galaxies <laughs> and universes. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, things are bigger than what we see here. In fact, God says in the New Testament that a good soldier of Christ doesn't entangle himself with the affairs of this life. Right? We have to keep our eye on the prize. We have to keep our focus on what really matters. So, I want to read this next verse to you. John 4, 23, and this is where we sum up the whole sermon right here. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Now, spirit and truth, it makes it very clear that he's, he's saying there's a difference there. So let's talk about the easy one and then the hard one. Truth. I, don't, I have a virtual Bible. The truth is everything that's written in that book. Do I believe everything that's written in that book? Do I, am I knowledgeable about what's in that book? Do I know about the story of Jericho? Do I know about Jehoshaphat? Do I know about Noah and the ark? Do I, do I know about all these things that he 
provided for us to reassure us of what he can do, what he's doing, what he's going to do. Do I, do I have the truth? That's the truth. So we have to worship him believing in this stuff, knowing this stuff. Now, the tougher one is the spirit. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, pull punches here. I'm not going to pretend that everybody that comes to Surfside is a believer. There are people that come to our church and they go through the motion. They sing these songs and they raise their hands sometimes. And they might pray or they might do whatever. But if they're not, if they're not saved, if they're not born again, if they haven't surrendered their lives to Christ, then they're not of the Spirit, and the Spirit's not in them. And since God said, I am a spirit, and you have to worship me in spirit, that means I have to dwell inside you. So we have to make sure, number one, before we even think about worshiping and praising, that we actually really have a relationship with Christ. That's step one. The rest is meaningless. In fact, when we talk about this illustration, it makes me think of a passage my dad had in his Bible. My entire childhood growing up, I could always open up the first page of every Bible he ever owned, and right there he always had the same words, and I, I, that's why I have in my head today. And it said, if there is no God, nothing matters. And if there is a God, nothing else matters. Right? So I want to make sure you guys hear that clearly. you got to, you got to check yourself out. If God isn't prompting you to worship him, you need to make sure there's a reason why you don't feel him inside you and make sure we get him inside us. Okay? And you can always talk to any of us uh, from the church afterwards if you want to make sure you're sure. I used to have a pastor who used to say, you know, do you know that you know that you know? Right? Because we don't want to get to the end of this little green section and find out that we were just playing a game, okay? This is real. Now, one last point. Why is it that when we have something that we think is amazing, like a sunset that Brian sends us, or a big 12-pound bass that Robert Knapp likes to send me pictures of, why do we want to share that? Why is it that we say, man, I'm loving this experience. I sure wish there was somebody here to share it with. Well, guess what? That's not an accident. That's not human chemical, you know, makeup. God put that inside of you. That's, that is what he likes to refer to as completing the cycle of joy. Because when you have something that you love and you admire, you want to share that with somebody else. In fact, C.S. Lewis quoted something about that. He said, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses, but it completes the enjoyment, right? I feel, for some reason, I feel a little bit even better when I share that joke with you, right? <laughs> you might not feel better, but I feel a little better when I, when I share the joke. Thank you, Don. You know? Um, in fact, uh, in verse, in John 15, 11, uh, God says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So he knows, you know, if you're embracing, if you're focusing on me, if you're living in the reality of my presence, you will naturally be grateful and you'll want to share that sunrise, you're going to be thinking about God in things. You know, look at that, look at those birds. Look at this, I love snow. I don't know what it is. It's God. You just love the other way he's expressing an opportunity to worship. Why do I like something and maybe Johnette doesn't like it? You know, maybe I love a certain song and it doesn't, doesn't do anything for her. God has given us all things that we enjoy so that we can pass it back to him. And complete the circle. I love sunrises. I don't like, I like to sleep during the sunrise, right? But you know what? But I like twilight. For some reason, that's my thing. Walk outside, 
and seeing the stars start to come alive, I just start praising God. I start, you know, worshiping. He's given us all something, 12-pound bass. Who knows? He's given us stuff to say, thank you, God. That, you know, you're awesome. So, so I want to conclude with just some uh, one verse, and that's Hebrews 13, 15. How do we basically worship? Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. And how do we do that? The fruit of our lips, openly professing his name, giving him credit. And do not forget to do good. So now we're talking about acts, right? Words and deed. To do good and to share with others. Complete the circle. For with such sacrifices... God is pleased. That's how you please God. Confess to him his name. Give him credit. Do good things to each other and share with others to complete that circle. So, worship is a commandment. That's why we do it. That's why we're supposed to do it. Worship is warfare. It's powerful. Use it. It's, it's, he's at your disposal 24-7, 365. Just remind yourself and the way you remind yourself, make you sure you're on the right focus. Don't be caught up in this. This is going to be gone so fast. It's trivial. So I've left a verse in the, in the bulletin for you guys. I mean, a, a, a prayer. If you want to hang on to that, that, maybe this week, at some point you might need to pray. It's just to help us refocus ourselves because you know what? Ten billion things are going to hit you after you walk out this door. And that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to distract you from everything you heard today. But I want you to think about what your focus is. And I hope that, that rope illustration stays with you forever like it has with me. It's been probably the most powerful thing I've ever been shown in my entire Christian life. So, All right, well, let's pray, and we're going to transition back to worship through music. <laughs> Dear Lord, thank you so much for today and for the people that you've had join us. And Lord, I just thank you for, uh, for the words that you've spoken through me, Lord. And I pray that your words will not return vain, just like your Bible says. And we just uh, worship you and uh, adore you, Lord, for everything that you've done in this world and in the next that you have planned for us. And we just thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>